G'day everyone, today I want to talk about ferroelectric materials. So ferroelectric materials, why are we looking at a inductor? Well this inductor has a ferromagnetic core. Ferromagnetism you know, is fairly well understood, people have fridge magnets etc and understand that uh, magnetic materials such as ferromagnets can be permanently magnetized and they can store this, this magnetic field for very long periods of time and this can be used for memory. For example, in, uh, in the old days before we had cheap semiconductors, they used to use little tiny ferrite cores in uh, computer core memory. This, uh, this property, like many things in nature, also has an electric copy of it. The, the magnetic properties that you see in ferromagnets, there is a, an analogous ferroelectric property in uh, dielectric materials. They're called ferroelectric materials rather than dielectric materials when they possess this particular like super electric field um, storing property that, uh, that dielectrics don't normally have. So ferroelectric materials are actually much more common than you might think. Some of these capacitors, these three here on the right, are actually ferroelectric capacitors. The ceramic that's in them is um, lead zirconium titanate, which is a solid solution of lead zirconate and lead titanate. They uh, have a natural ferroelectric property that's actually annoying for these capacitors and causes nonlinearities and losses and instabilities in the capacitors. It's actually quite detrimental to their operation, which is generally why these physically small but large value capacitors are only used for you know, relatively non-important roles like decoupling or um, coupling between circuits uh, you know, at audio frequencies, etc. On the other hand, this uh, mylar capacitor here has exactly the same value but as you can see it's physically quite a bit larger but it's much more stable. Now to demonstrate this effect I built a pretty simple little circuit which we have over here. Um, I'll show you the circuit diagram in a minute but our capacitor under test is this guy here. It's another PZT ceramic capacitor 100 nanofarad and I've got this being sweeped by a signal generator at one kilohertz and I'm graphing the voltage across the capacitor versus the time integral of the current that I've passed into the capacitor. So you can think of this as charge and that's exactly what it is. It's proportional to the charge that's gone into the capacitor. As you can see here at room temperature the capacitor looks like any other capacitor. It's nice and linear. The slope gives you an idea of the capacitance. If it was a, a higher value it would be steeper because the amount of charge necessary for the same voltage would be much larger because of the extra capacity of it to store charge. It would be much more shallow if it was a smaller value capacitor. Now I'm going to cool down that capacitor down here with freezer spray. You can see an interesting thing happens. Once it gets below a certain temperature, it actually becomes ferroelectric and you get this hysteresis curve which looks a whole lot like the BH curve of a ferromagnetic material. And this actually represents a ferroelectric memory. There's a path dependence in the current and um, the charge versus voltage curve of the capacitor. This can be used to make ferroelectric memory. Also, it's quite annoying from a, the point of view of actually using one of these things in a circuit because uh, obviously the value of that capacitor changes and, it, and there's losses. The, any area inside that curve basically means power lost because you've warmed up the dielectric in moving the charges around in it. Now if I heat up the capacitor with my soldering iron, you'll notice that it rapidly loses capacitance. That's also very bad if, say, the capacitor was being used in a, in a timing or, or some other critical application where its value was very sensitive and you would use one of those mylar capacitors if you wanted in that kind of application instead of one of these PZT dielectric capacitors. Alrighty, let's have a look at the circuit that I've used for this simple experiment. Over here we have the uh, the basic circuit sort of at a high level. We've got our device under test, we've got a signal generator passing a, a, you know, a voltage over this capacitor. I put a small resistor in to allow me to measure the current that's flowing through the capacitor but that, uh, that causes a small problem in that I've now got an offset voltage so I can't simply measure the voltage directly across the capacitor I need to subtract the voltage, measure the voltage here and I can't put the crow probes across it obviously because I'd short out my signal generator so I built a fairly simple little circuit. Down here we have two buffer amplifiers so that we're um, offering a fairly high impedance to the, the rest of the test circuit 
and out of that comes two, you know, these are non-inverting buffers, same value resistors, it's a gain of one across the, the circuit. So you get two voltages, those voltages are then subtracted to give the, um, the voltage directly across the capacitor, and the voltage representing the current is integrated using this integrator, which has just got a capacitor, I actually used exactly the same value, so the answer would come out in coulombs if I balanced out the resistance as well, but I chose to make this resistor variable so I could vary the gain of the, um, of the integrator and uh, keep the signal on the screen, basically. There's also a uh, small resistor across, uh, sorry, a large resistor, in this case it's 470 kilo ohms, across this capacitor to discharge any DC offset that's uh, caused by non-linearities in the circuit. But otherwise the entire thing is driven by AC and if everything was perfect you wouldn't need this resistor, but in a practical circuit it's quite handy. Anyway, the output of the time integral of that current term that's, that's sensed by this resistor is the actual charge across, that's in the capacitor. And when you graph them, you get that pretty hysteresis curve. Okay, so we talked briefly about the different materials and, and how this hysteretic curve actually represents storage of, of charge in the capacitor dielectric and also loss if you're, if you're using it in a, in a linear circuit of some description. But this storage of, of a remnant amount of charge in the, uh, in the dielectric, in the, of the ferroelectric material, can actually be used as a memory. So what you would do, uh, you might want to read the, the Wikipedia article about ferroelectric uh, memory and about RAM in general, but basically you would replace the normal dielectric material in, uh, in a single cell of a, of a RAM with a, a piece of this ferroelectric material. And by polarizing that material across the, the gate and the substrate, you can produce a stored charge in here that can then be read out later. Um, unfortunately, the read is, is destructive as far as I understand, and the access times and the, the scale and, and general cost of the devices are still not particularly competitive with other memory technologies. But it is getting there, and it may in fact replace flash once there's been uh, more investment in it. Alrighty, so we talked about PZT, which is this solid solution of um, lead titanate and lead zirconate. The mixture of those two, one is ferroelectric and one is anti-ferroelectric, so they tend to cancel each other out. Ferroelectric materials have this domain, it's kind of like the magnetic domains in, um, in ferromagnets, that are lined up all in the one direction. Anti-ferroelectric materials have them in opposite directions, and in a bulk amount of the material they tend to cancel each other out. So. These materials are great because they have large dielectric constants, so you can make really small, physically small capacitors that have very large values. But unfortunately, it also makes them very temperature unstable, as you've seen. Non-linear, they have saturation effects, and they are ways of optimizing the mixture of these two materials to try and cancel it out. So near room temperature, you get you know what you'd expect something that looks like a normal capacitor, because this this large dielectric constant is really uh, a great feature and is hard to ignore, but it does make these capacitors only really suitable for applications such as decoupling. Alrighty, um, hope that was fun. We'll probably talk about uh, ferromagnets in the future and maybe we'll do some BH curves on them.